All right. Well, welcome everybody who has joined us today for Are You an Insect? My name is Drew Bush, and I'm the Director of Programs at the Fairbanks Museum and our Planetarium. And I just wanted to shout out or give you an introduction to our educator who will be leading the session, Leela Nordman. Um, before I do that, I just wanted to run through a few things. I know some of you may be joining us either in Zoom um, or on our YouTube live stream, or maybe even watching on Kingdom Access Television. And we are really excited and thankful to have you all here with us today. Um, we'll of course be continuing to offer this live programming for K through eighth grades and for the public throughout the duration of the COVID-19 crisis for free. Um, and just for those of you in Zoom, there's a couple ways you can interact with our educator today. So I just wanted to point those out. You can actually, at the bottom of your screen, if you mouse over sort of the bottom or move your cursor, you'll see a Q&A tab. So you can definitely chat in that Q&A tab. You can write questions. Our presenter or myself will try to answer them in text form, or she'll answer them live in our class today. You can also use the chat button. So you'll see that a few buttons to the right of where the Q&A is. Um, that's a way that you can specify to chat with just me, to chat with just Leela, or to chat with anybody else or everybody in our class today. And then finally, you can also ask questions of Leela today if you click the button that says raise your hand. Um, so that will actually give me a little ping and it'll notify me to promote you to actually share your video and audio, which you'll also have to do. Um, and then you can interact live during the class today with our educator. Um, please note that we are recording this session as is Kingdom Access Television. So if you're thinking about raising your hand, be aware that that's the case. All of our classes will also be archived on our website on the virtual learning tab. So if, if you have friends or family that miss a class, feel free to join us there. So today's class, Are You an Insect? It's geared for K through second graders, but all are welcome to join. And I'll turn it over now to Leela Norman, thanks. Great, thank you so much, Drew. Um, so again, one of the educators at the museum, uh, but I'm meeting you at home today. <laughs> so we may have had classes in the past, but uh, this is one that I really enjoy uh, just discussing what an insect is and sort of in comparison to you. So first, let's name off some insects. Uh, so ones for me that come to mind are like bees, butterflies, dragonflies, maybe a ladybug. Um, so those are some of the insects that I think of right away. Um, do you guys look like any of those? What do you think when you're looking in the mirror? Do you have wings, have a whole bunch of extra legs, anything like that? Uh, well, hopefully not. <laughs> but if you, um, if you really look at yourself, you want to think about where is your skeleton? So thinking about like feeling around on your body, where is your skeleton? Is it on the inside or is it on the outside? Uh, and so that's one major difference. Yours being on the inside as you grow, you don't have to do something which insects do called molting. And that is literally where they have to split open their skin and emerge as a bigger insect. So that's something that we don't worry about. Um, but in insects, one of the reasons they molt is because their skeleton is on the outside of their body. So thinking about having it restricts you, it keeps you small until you break through and then you become a slightly larger insect at that time. So um, that exoskeleton, so that's a big word, yours is an endoskeleton, so inside, theirs is an exo or outside skeleton. It's a, a little bit ma like made out of the same materials. If you look at your hair and your nails, it's something called keratin. And so it's constantly growing. We think about having to clip it and everything. Uh, and an insect has something called chitin. It's this like slightly harder form of like your um, fingernails. And it's what also gives them that strength. You think about a, um, a, an ant lifting 10 times its weight. Most of that is because the exoskeleton is so hard and can actually uh, carry some, most of that weight for them. So, in order for them to grow larger again, they have to molt. So they have to actually break through their exoskeleton. All right, so let's see about um, 
body parts. So I think this is where I'm gonna go to share a screen. So uh, desktop, okay. And let me go ahead and open this up. So here's where I wanna show, whoop, there we go. Um, again, head. So this is similar to yours, right? Uh, except when you get to something called the thorax, which is kind of like your chest area, instead of having arms come out of your chest area, an insect may have wings and most definitely uh, three pairs of legs or six legs total coming out of that thorax. Um, and then this third part, so we're looking at three body parts. The last part is their abdomen. So think about on your body, anywhere below your rib cage, before your legs, where it's nice and soft, that is your abdomen, sort of your, where your gut is. Um, and the same thing on an insect, their abdomen is actually the last part of their body here. So three parts, head, thorax, and abdomen. Uh, three words that you can definitely practice saying at home. Um, and one thing I wanted to notice is that their um, mouth, they may have mouths that can chew or um, mouths that can have a sucking part. So thinking about like a um, mosquito or um, biting, some a, a biting mouth. But you in fact can do all three of those with your mouth. Uh, so insects have very specific mouth parts compared to us. Uh, and so just a few other things. So here we've got our head, thorax, and abdomen again, except another big difference, antenna. This kind of tells them what the world is like all around them. Um, compound eye gives them the visual information, but unlike where you see one image, they would see thousands of the exact same image. Um, and again, here's our mouth parts down here, which can, uh, can be those three different types. And then you've got your six pairs of legs that are attached to our thorax, perhaps a pair of wings, not all insects have wings, but um, definitely wings there. And then in the abdomen, you'll actually see this funny word and it's called spiracles. And that is for you, when you take a large breath of air, you do it actively. You are pulling in, you're using your diaphragm to pull air into your lungs and push it back out. Insects don't need to do that. They actually just let the air sort of wash over them. So they, they just are passive breathers is what we call it instead of an active breather like you are. So that's some of the differences, but now here's another major difference, one that you might know very well, and I'm gonna use one of our more popular ambassadors of the insect world, someone we know very well. Here's our monarch. So our monarch we might know starts out as an egg and then moves into something called a caterpillar. And then you may recognize the chrysalis. So um, this stage where it actually, it's not moving at all. It's very stationary, it's green and blending in with its environment. And then it moves to the uh, adult that emerges, those wings, actually these are the wing plates right here are tucked in and then it uses fluid from a large abdomen to push into those wings and actually extend them out almost like sails. And as they dry, that gives the butterfly lift. Um, so again, this is, this is a life cycle that is very different from yours. Uh, it's not something that you would ever experience. <laughs> um, you just continue from a very small size of having all the same parts and continue to grow and bigger and bigger and bigger um, until you get to your adult um, size. So I just wanna show you quickly, um, this is where that egg is and here's sort of the whole life cycle, those caterpillars munching away, getting bigger and bigger and bigger, something hopefully we get to see this summer. Um, and here it goes into what we call a J formation. So it's actually attached itself to the leaf with a little bit of silk and it starts to curl up. And then it actually, and here's another molting. So as each stage of these caterpillars, they actually split and molt their skin. Um, but this is the final molt or where they split that skin, that sort of um, hard exterior and it allows a chrysalis to form underneath it. And here again, you can see here, this is the abdomen, here are the wings, and so you could really see it here. And then as the butterfly emerges, those wings start to fill up again um, with that fluid, and then the adult is able to fly off. 
Uh, but now I want to look at a life cycle of a slightly different insect, but one uh, that we're going to look a little more closely at uh, towards the end here. Whoops, sorry. Before that, <laughs> I just wanted to point out we do have a butterfly that I'm hoping uh, you all here in Vermont get to see um, in the next few weeks. It's called the morning cloak. Um, and what's strange about this one is, is our monarch. We saw that, uh, you know, goes through the caterpillar and the chrysalis and then the butterfly uh, all sort of in, in a you know, few weeks uh, of cycle. But this one actually overwinters or lives as an adult. And so in this uh, sort of look and stage throughout the winter, it actually hides underneath um, like under tree um, bark, anywhere it can find a place to overwinter. And it, it doesn't freeze. It has almost sort of like sugary, um, sort of sugar it won't completely freeze in the winter and it'll so it won't crystallize or die it won't kill those the cells it'll actually allow it to live and so this is one of the first butterflies you get to see early in spring and so it's one i would definitely look for and when they close their wings they look exactly like the bark around them but they are beautiful when they open their wings so i just want to point out a butterfly that you may get to see is one of the longest lived butterflies uh, 11 months but think about for most of winter they are dormant or we could say sleeping. They're not moving at that time. Okay, so this is the life cycle I wanted to show you um, that's a little bit different. We looked at with our butterfly, so this is um, you know, our ladybug, so starts out as eggs, but then we're calling this stage a larva, which looks a little bit like the caterpillar. It's, it's moving, but this one happens to have uh, longer legs on it. It's feeding, it's got feeding mouth parts to eat some, some plants and or aphids actually, sorry, these guys, do not eat plants, these guys eat other insects. So they've got sort of chewing mouth parts. Um, and then here's the pupa, kind of like that chrysalis stage. They're not moving um, and they're changing over at this point into our adult. And so again, we can see our adult with our six legs. And this, this one actually has wings. They are just underneath um, this covering that we'll look at a little closer. So here's our adult. All right, so now we have a little bit of a quiz. We want to see who is not an insect. So I'm going to go to this page um, and go ahead and take a look and thinking about what you've learned now, sort of counting legs, maybe noticing wings. Granted, these are silhouettes or just the image, um, a, a black image of these insects. Uh, so it might be a little bit harder to tell, but do your best and think about the ones that don't match what we've been talking about. So just taking a look at, maybe looking at those, some of the antenna, some of the different shapes. You might even recognize some of these insects. All right, so is everyone ready? Did you guess these? Were these your top? So we've got our friend, you might recognize this one, and hopefully you recognize this one and you can see these all just don't work out, mostly because they just have too many legs. So let's go ahead and, and look at our um, next one, because these, you might, you know, fly, bee, butterfly, ladybug, you've got your dragonfly, this is a, a praying mantis, um, I believe this is a grasshopper, stag beetle, which is really cool with those big, so those are sort of bout, biting mouth parts that could clamp on to something. Um, our so aunt. Question, Lila. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From the audience on YouTube, just wondering why isn't a spider or an arachnid an uh, insect? Awesome. Great. So that is actually, look at that. You lined me up for our next slide. <laughs> so we want to look at why these guys, especially a spider, might not be considered an insect. Uh, and so what I want you to do quickly with me is just count the legs. And so we're going to ignore these sort of front pieces here, but we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we're already outside of the insects, which should only have three pairs or six legs. And so if we come over to our spider arachnid, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So again, eight. And if you actually look at your tick, these guys are actually all related, these three here, because again, you've got your eight legs and it's hard to see, but you actually have, and we'll look at another slide more closely, but you have a head thorax and a huge abdomen, same thing here, head thorax and huge abdomen, and same thing with our, our spider, um, sorry, our scorpion. 
and all the legs come out of the head thorax and then you have this very long abdomen here um and so these front like on the spider it's called palpi and these are actually feeling they're almost like antenna they let the spider feel around so some people think spiders might even have like 10 legs because these palpi can qu be quite large um, and then these are sort of very modified or, or palpi where you've got pincers at the the end so this is again how this um animal might catch things or feel around in its world um, to see what's next. Uh, ticks do not have that. Um, as far as I know, I haven't, you'd have to really look at the mouth parts very closely. Um, but one thing that these guys also, these two have in common is venom. So we think about venom as being in one place on the body. So on this one, it's produced in the tail. Uh, on the spider, it's produced we call fangs or chelicera in that area. And actually the third one that has it is our centipede, um, which also can have a little venom in, um, in their mouths uh, or in their bite. But what I learned is centipede, think of as a hundred feet, um, that if you break that word down, but truthfully, they only have 30 to 354 legs. I didn't know that, or 15 pairs to 70, 177 pairs, which I thought was really fascinating. So uh, centipedes can have a lot of legs, <laughs> many more than a than 100. Um, so let's just look at our spider a little more closely because that was a great question. Why is it? So we've got the leg issue, right? We've got our eight legs, but we also Instead of three body parts, uh, hopefully you notice a distinct two body part here. So we've got, they call it a cephalothorax, which is a big word for head and chest. And then you've got your abdomen, which is really um, quite large, but attached. So there's always a waist on spiders. Um, so there's a spot, it's kind of like um, a bee has a waist. Uh, and then the spinnerets. Um, and then these are sort of the palpi, sort of help them feel around in their world. And of course, instead of these compound eyes, they have many different eyes. Some are simple um, and some are very, um, actually, I, I, should, I don't know if they have compound eyes. I know they have simple eyes and, and many other eyes. So that would be something actually for folks to, to look up or certainly for me to look up um, in the near future. So I just wanted to, bring up two spiders that people commonly see. Um, this is a barn spider and I just wanted to show you, so all the legs here are coming out of that cephalothorax, which is right here. And then they have giant abdomens. By the end of summer into fall, you might see these silhouetted in the night sky and their abdomens are just huge. Um, they're they're um, usually hang from like underneath your deck or places where, so once you see them silhouetted, they they are very distinct. And this is also the spider used in Charlotte's web, or is Charlotte. Um, and then our other spider I want to show you is one that people constantly um, see, which is called a wolf spider. And just notice how the abdomen and the cephalothorax are much closer in shape um, and size. And then check out those palpi. You can really see it on this one. So again, those eight legs, but those nice little palpi that it feels the world around with. Um, all right, so those are some of our typical Vermont spiders. Oops. And then let me, I just wanna show you one that I think is really neat. It's not a uh, butterfly that we have around here, but it's called a leaf wing. And uh, I just want you to notice how much it is trying to blend in with its environment and look like a leaf and how much it's trying to hide its sort of legs. So you're, it's trying for you not to notice that it's an insect. I don't know if you can see right here, but that's the eye. And then it takes its antenna, and this is a behavior where it tucks it between its uh, wings so that it looks absolutely like a leaf and couldn't be tracked or caught by a lizard or a snake or anything that might be in the jungle who's interested in eating this butterfly. So I just want to show you one that I think is very unique um, in the way that its wings are copying something completely different in its environment. All right, and then the last person I want, or person, <laughs> insect, sorry, <laughs> that I want to introduce is our friend, um, the ladybug. And so I just think this is our nine spotted, this is a local ladybug, uh, but it turns out that there are about 40 species of ladybug in Vermont, but not all are actually native. So I wanna see if I can pull this up. There's a great website and all of this is gonna be on a resource document that we put on 
our website. So if you want to go to the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, this link is there. But what's really great about it is you can see, you know, different ladybugs or lady beetles. Um, lady bird is another word for them. But they're a great insect because you can um, easily find them, which I'll show you how to do. Uh, but this will tell you which ones are invasives, like the Asian lady beetle or the European seven spotted lady bird. Um, so these are some that you may you may come across. And the great thing is, uh, so let me see if I, oops, if I, oh wait, no, if I, I can't remember, Drew, if I keep sharing, can I show you what's in my container here? <laughs> Do I need to stop sharing? Does that help? Oh, you, yeah, you would just need to stop sharing your screen so that we can. Okay, so can you see this now? <laughs> so, all right. So one of the activities that I think is really neat this time of year, especially is if you have any kind of glass container and just a you know, flat top, this is a mason jar. But I don't know if you can see in here, these are all lady beetles or bugs and they're moving pretty quickly <laughs> um, that I collect, oop, and they're about to fly off, that I collected from my windows because right now we've got this, it's kind of cooler weather, but then you have these really sunny, nice warm days. And if you have a south facing or sunny window, you probably see tons of these lady beetles right now and you can easily capture them. They're pretty slow but you can really observe them up close and, and see you know, all the behaviors or physical um, things that make them an insect, but also you can start to identify, you, if you want to, you can actually send some, you know, take some pictures, send them to us to try to identify, but also there are other links, especially that Vermont um, Center for Eco Studies, which has ways of identifying all of the ladybugs that you might find in your house. So that's one activity I think that would be um, a really great one. It's easy to do. They're inside and it'll probably make your parents really happy if you collect them all up and then release them outside. <laughs> so feel free to do that. But they're, they're just coming in because it's nice and warm and there's no, think about it, there's no aphids. There's no um, of these smaller insects right now that feed on plants uh, because there's been so much snow cover. So they've been actually hiding in places like wood piles, anywhere that, that gets a great about, um amount of sun that protect, like heats that wood pile up and also keeps them um, sort of protected through the winter. Um, so one other insect that I wanted to show you that I found was my little friend, uh, I don't know if you can see him, woolly bear. Um, this one is now active. When I found it, it looked, I thought, you know, maybe it is actually, um, had dried up and died, but actually it hadn't. It was curled up into a tiny little ball. I found it right near the entrance to a shed, uh, hiding under some leaf litter. And this is another um, insect where, again, these guys, unlike our morning cloaks that we said overwinter as an adult, these guys you can find all winter long um, overwintering as a caterpillar. Um, and so they won't necessarily whoop, come out until the fall. Oh no, <laughs> we had a woolly bear down, hold on. <laughs> um, so again, another um, you know stage in the life cycle that you can easily find and collect up. And as soon as they come into warmer um, temperatures, they will begin to move just like mine did. And they will also stick to your fingers, hold on. <laughs> I'm gonna put my little woolly bear back down. Um, so this is a great time of the year to start looking for insects, especially, you know, those ladybugs in your window, but also going out to the wood pile and seeing uh, where you can um, find them, you know, basically I would say sheds anywhere or uh, log piles or even leaf litter. Start looking up like where, where might you find those insects um, and close behind you're going to find those arachnids, those spiders. So realize in some of these places, like in sheds and things like that, they have overwintered too. And so you might start to find um, spiders and things like that. But again, we're really looking for our insects. And, and I would say like yesterday when it was more sunny, I was finding flies outside in, in sandy places where it was there was a lot of sunlight. Um, but I haven't seen any, uh, like our morning cloak, I haven't seen that yet. I've been looking. Um, and again, the spring azure, which is another butterfly that will sort of appear right after that. Those are, are things to look forward to. Uh, but right now you can do some great insect hunting in your house. <laughs> <laughs> One question from YouTube, uh, Lila. 
just people are wondering if they're going to look for insects, where are the best places to find both inside your house or outside, you know, over the next month? Yeah, well, I would definitely because the, oops, we're good. Okay. Um, because they, that is one of the, one of the places. So any South facing or very sunny windows is going to be a great place to find them. Um, but definitely outside, you know, that leaf litter or wood piles, um, or sheds, you know, opening the, slowly open the door of your shed, you may find them sort of in the cracks, especially if it's on a sunny, sunny side of that, um, shed. So you can definitely, uh, and just good luck hunting. I think, you know, what's cool about it is when you start to look, the more things you find very quickly. <laughs> I don't know if there's any other, um, questions or I have one short video that I can I'm hoping will work <laughs> well, so let me just remind people who maybe joined on YouTube you can definitely chat to ask questions in our YouTube chat on the upper right hand of the website page you're probably looking at with our live feed um, and if you're in zoom feel free to write your questions in the chat um, you'll see the ones I've posted there you can also use the Q&A button or you can um, raise your hand as I've said to ask questions live so thank you, everyone. <laughs> All right, I will share. Um, and um, if it doesn't totally work, this again is in the resource um, page of, uh, let's see, desktop. Um, but let me see if we can pull up this National Geographic. So let me see if I can make this full screen, if it will let me. OK, so hopefully everyone's are seeing that. And then. This is kind of neat. They're looking at the inner workings of, and now notice how they unfold their wings. Um, so think about like they have this hard shell, I believe it's called the Elyra, and then they can unfold these very strong wings that they fly with. And you can really see the abdomen at the back of the beetle. And then they have to, oh, sorry, Elytra. Um, and then they have to fold their wings back and pull them back in, which is pretty amazing. And so that case on the outside is what gives them their color, but they're trying to figure out how do these guys fold their wings. And so they actually created wings. So this isn't a real wing. This is a um, wing that the scientists made, and it's, they're watching it how, and look how it's using its legs to help it bring that wing back underneath. And so just realizing that uh, these guys are, are very well studied <laughs> uh, just to understand how they fold their wings, which I think is pretty amazing. So again, that'll, that's linked to um, in, let me stop sharing, there we go. Ooh. So that's, that'll be linked to also again in the resource page. So having a, a few, few things that uh, you can look at. And certainly this is a great time of year to do a little citizen science. So uh, again, collecting up those um, beetles and then looking at them one by one and attempting to identify them. And if you want help, you can easily take a, a photograph with a phone and send it in um, and we'll do our best to identify them. But also um, Vermont uh, Center for Eco Studies and Vermont um, Atlas of Life is really interested in our lady um, bugs and what ladybugs you might have uh, to offer. So, um, so that is my class for today. If there's any more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, look for more of our classes uh, in the near future. We'll start tomorrow. <laughs> and I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us again today. And of course, to thank Leela for her, her amazing class just now for our K through second graders. We are gonna be keeping our classes for younger ages nice and short like this one. Um, but if you have a middle schooler or somebody older at home, please do check out our schedule. We'll have uh, longer classes on there where you can again interact with us on Zoom or on YouTube. If you have trouble um, you know, with high quality internet, you can also of course find us on Kingdom Access Television. Um, so just a reminder, if you want to contact us, of course, visit fairbanksmuseum.org. There's a contact form right there to send in your pictures of ladybugs. Um, and you'll find under our Learn tab at the top of the website, you'll find a drop-down menu item that's called Virtual Learning. And on there, you'll be able to find all of our schedule for the week, which includes two classes a day for K-8 students, 
as well as some public programs, including our Wednesday update on COVID-19. So thank you again all for joining us today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Great, thank you. <laughs>